Yo, what up? Welcome back to another episode. I just want to take a moment to address the rumors that haven't been swirling around. Yes, I have been growing a mohawk mullet. Do you enjoy spending a small fortune on film processing? Have you ever wanted to shoot Cinestill 50D like it was Portra 400? Well boy do I have the video for you. On every film cartridge of Cinestill, they write push one, two, and three stops. Like they were personally challenging me to actually push it three stops. And guess what? That's what I did. Cinestill 50D is a daylight balanced motion picture film rated at you guessed it, 50 ISO. What Cinecil does is they work their magic and they remove a layer from the motion picture film called the Remjet layer so that the film can be developed in standard C41 chemicals. The side effects of not having the Remjet layer on the film are as follows. Psychosis, impotence, blood shards, and death. Oh wait, no, that's if you take bath salts. Halation is the side effect that I'm looking for but we'll get into that later. Pushing a 50 ISO film three stops means we're gonna be shooting it at 400 ISO instead of 50 ISO. So that means we're gonna be underexposing this film by three stops of light. To compensate for the underexposure, I asked the lab to develop the film longer. This process as a whole generally results in more contrast and more grain. It's worth mentioning too that labs generally charge more to push or pull your film. And you also have to develop the entire roll as pushed or not at all. Damn, someone took their, uh... They're cruising too. Holy shit, we weren't even going that fast. It's because we suck, bro. Dirt road. Anyway, it was time to shoot, and I figured we should go big or go home. And while most of the time I'm down to go home, Caleb and I actually headed out to the desert to shoot some abandoned buildings that surprisingly have not been destroyed with graffiti yet. They say load in subdued light. <laughs> I shot with my trusty steed, the Canon AE-1, with the 28mm lens. All right, well you might have noticed right off the bat that a lot of these shots get very muddy in the shadows pretty quickly. This can be easily explained. Because we're underexposing the film by three stops, which is quite heavy, and then trying to lift up whatever information is available on the negative, a lot of the shadow detail just never existed. Color negative film doesn't handle shadow information as well as it does highlight information, so when it's underexposed, the shadows get quite muddy. Ultimately, pushing your film isn't going to create any additional detail that wasn't already captured on the negative. It's only going to brighten the details that were already present. Some of these shots really did not turn out at all, like this one. I was using my Canon AE-1's internal light meter, and I suppose it's possible that it leans more towards the highlights in most cases. Having an extra three stops of light probably would have saved some of that shadow detail too, but hey, what the f can you do? Anyway, as we cruised from building to building, all in various states of decrepitness, similar to me and my friend's livers, we noticed that the small population of locals were keeping an eye on us. But frankly, we didn't really care. We were just glad that we didn't stumble upon any murder scenes in any of those houses. Oh. 
Another thing I definitely noticed with these shots was there were a lot of color shifting. I used Negative Lab Pro in Lightroom to invert all of my shots, and frankly, they looked like ass. More specifically, Michelangelo's ass. The turtle, not the painter. The shots leaned heavily into this like teal turquoise wash and needed heavy color correction to get some semblance of an image that is somewhat white balanced. This is probably because pushing film, especially color film, produces a lot of color shifts. So that's something to look out for if you're brave enough to even do this dumb shit in the first place. So there are a couple of reasons, besides peer pressure, that you might want to push your film. Maybe you're shooting at a low ISO in low light and you just need that extra range or brightness. Or maybe you want more contrast on your negatives and are simply too afraid of the contrast slider in Lightroom. Either way, I'd say that this process is a lot more common for black and white film. What's up, dog? After a little while, we finally arrived at my favorite building, a little off the beaten path. Inside there were a lot of photo opportunities as it was still relatively untouched and even still had some furniture. Unlike some of the other buildings where all we found was a swarm of pissed off hornets. Holy sh Now you may be thinking, wait, this is Cinestill. Where are the violent over-the-top halations that are a major characteristic of this film? While there still are some halations present, I think because we are underexposing the film so heavily to begin with, it brought a lot of the highlight information down to the point where that effect didn't really happen. So there we were, having the time of our lives, firing off a bunch of shots that may or may not turn out amazing. The world was our oyster. We were living in ignorant bliss, and in that moment we felt untouchable. But that all came crashing down when, well, I'll spare you the details, but it ended when we had to Google search angry carpenter ants biting penis. A lot of these shots are noticeably grainy. As I mentioned before, pushing your film ups the contrast and ups the grain. For black and white film, I generally think that that look is pretty cool, but for color film, I'm not so sure that that look works as well. Additionally, this was shot on 35mm. If this was shot on 120 film, not only would it be sexier because bigger format is better, but also the grain would obviously be less significant.
stopped at one last spot that we had no idea what it was or I guess what it used to be. Based on the evidence that was all around us, it seemed like a place that local teenagers would go to make out, listen to dubstep, and chug four locos. Also, apparently they come here to worship some sort of ceremonial idol. Kids these days. Anyway, the light was amazing so we blasted away, regardless of the curse that was surely placed on us for trespassing. I think the effect of pushing Cinestill 50D worked the best around sunset time. The light isn't as harsh, so the film could render the difference in light a little bit better. Later on, as we chowed down on some Wendy's Baconators, which, uh, fun fact, was what we were originally going to name Baxter, we noticed the perfect light on the Walgreens across the way and just decided to finish up the roll. I didn't get any footage of this because the light was fleeting about as much as your interest in this video. Would I push Cinestill 50D three stops again in the future? Hell no. I think a lot of these shots are actually half decent, but they kind of get ruined by the lack of shadow detail. If I showed Ansel Adams any of these photos, he'd probably smack me upside the head and tell me I f***ed up the exposure settings. Hypothetically, if someone broke into my apartment and pointed a gun at my head, or worse, my Mamiya 7, and told me to push Cinestill 50D three stops again, I'd tell him, pull the trigger, bitch. Or I could just expose for the shadows. That'd probably be better. I could really only see someone needing to push this film if the light was getting really dim, like maybe it was blue hour or something. This is probably my favorite shot that I took that day. The lighting is pretty baller and the composition was not half bad. The colors are okay and at least some shadow detail is present. So that's that. If you liked the video or maybe even thought it was less shitty than the others, let me know in the comments. Or if there are any other films I should try pushing or pulling, please advise. But I'll tell you right now, you can stop asking me to push color plus six stops because it's never gonna happen. Touch it, Jason. Touch what? Ugh. Check out my new film camera, bro. How many greens does it shoot? So yeah, I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you thought this video looked better than the rest of my videos, then you're probably right. It's probably because I shot the entire video, with a few exceptions, on the Blackmagic 6K Pocket Cinema camera. Boy, that's a mouthful. Blackmagic reached out to the channel and asked if we'd be interested in collaborating on something. And of course I said, hell yeah, because I'm sure all of you guys are tired of me filming on my phone in potato quality. Let's talk a little bit about the pros and cons of the pocket camera, which definitely will not fit into your pocket. So as we were shooting, Caleb and I handed off the camera to one another, and I'd say the whole process was pretty simple. We had a T5 SSD drive that Blackmagic kindly lent to us, and we recorded most of the footage in 4K ProRes 422. The camera also accepts SD cards and CFast cards. One of my favorite parts of the camera is the touchscreen. You can change all your settings without fumbling around with like dials and buttons and stuff, which was a huge plus for me. Though admittedly, I do wish there were some games we could play on it, like Frogger, but hey, maybe in the next firmware update. You can also shoot in 4K 60 frames a second, like I did here, or you can switch over to glorious 6K RAW resolution. My mind was blown that you could shoot 6K RAW on a camera this size, definitely a major selling point. However, be warned, as far as I know, you can't shoot 6K to SD cards, and if you shoot Blackmagic RAW, you're gonna need to download Blackmagic's RAW SDK application before you can move the footage over to any of your editing applications. The body is super lightweight and never became a burden to carry, but nevertheless, it feels sturdy in your hands. It was hotter than the core of the sun that day in the desert, and the camera never had any overheating issues, which is really impressive. The dynamic range was pretty great. It's around 13 stops apparently, which I think is pretty on par with a lot of other cameras, but I'm no expert. We used some EF mount cinema lenses that Caleb brought along, and the whole process was pretty smooth overall. The back touchscreen comes in at a massive 5 inches. Well, massive to some. No judgment here. Additionally, you can attach a video monitor to the camera if 5 inches is not enough for you. Wink. 
In the interest of fairness, here are some of the cons we found with the camera. Keep in mind with any of this, these are just our opinions. Some of these things may not really matter as much to you. First and foremost, let's talk about the battery. The camera takes standard LP E6 batteries, which are common with Canon cameras, but I gotta say, they do not last very long at all. We weren't constantly rolling the camera, and we would even turn off the camera between takes, but I'd say each battery only lasted about one and a half hours on average. Compared to my Sony a7R2's battery, which is smaller in size and lasts twice as long, that's kind of rough. We were only supplied one battery in the kit that we received, and that definitely would not have been enough. Thankfully, the homie Caleb swooped in and dunked on everyone with some extra batteries we could use. On top of the camera, there's no hot shoe slot, so we had to rig up something to hold our microphone while we were shooting. I suppose with the screw up there, it's a little more flexible for most filmmakers to do whatever they need to do, but for very small run and gun productions like the crap we do for this channel, it would have been nice to have a hot shoe there. The camera comes in at a scorching $1,995 or 44,500 pesos. And if you're interested in learning more, there are some links in the description. So in the end, that's really all I have to say about the Blackmagic 6K Pocket Cinema camera, other than maybe you guys should consider shortening the name.